Dr. Askew has uh, gotten out of the field for a little bit here to come into what little bit of air conditioning we have right. in this uh, conference room. Uh, even in Blacksburg, you know, we broke 90 degrees yesterday, so the heat has arrived. Sean, thanks for taking the time to get out of the field for a little bit here. Yeah, glad to, to do be this. Here. Um, let's start off first of all with uh, post emergent grass control. Okay, do that do this. Oh, we've already got questions. We can wow. take some questions. There we go. How to treat violets in turf grass. And the second one is also violets and clover in mostly zoysia grass. Okay, that's a pretty good one. Um, zoysia grass is tolerant to a fairly broad range of herbicides as long as you're not applying these products at green up. So zoysia grass is uh, very susceptible to herbicides during the green up process, but once the plant is uh, green and actively growing, there are several products that, that can mildly discolor zoysia grass, especially if you have one of those very immaculate zoysia grass lawns that's getting routine fertility. Uh, but the, this type of discoloration is very short-lived on zoysia grass. If it's actively growing, it tends to go away uh, with, with, with products that are, that are registered. Uh, so violets, that's gonna be a tough one. You have a couple of options. Again, avoiding that green up period. Um, I would go for metsulfuron as a first choice it's very cheap it's available on the internet for about thirty dollars uh, and that would be enough in zoysia grass at a half ounce rate to treat four acres uh, so that could last you quite a while at a home lawn for 30 bucks um, another one that you can use is uh triclopyr turflon ester now you you have to be very careful with rates you can mix metsulfuron and a fairly uh what i would call a moderate rate of turflon which would be about 16 ounces per acre um, and that's going to, with the turf line in there, possibly cause a little bit of discoloration to the zoysia, but it'll really help out on the violet control. The metsulfuron by itself, although slow acting, it's going to get the clover and it's going to really sh shut down the violet. A couple of applications of that by itself, you might want to try that first because it's going to be the safest option. Again, though, metsulfuron can be very injurious during green up, so avoid green ups. But, but right now, we're, we're in great shape to apply metsulfuron at about a half, quarter ounce to a half ounce rate on zoysia grass and uh, use a non-ionic surfactant. That product's very sensitive to uh, having surfactant in the tank to uh, help with the absorption process. Sean, what if, uh, so it's not only zoysia, because one of the first questions was just wild violet control in general. Okay. How about in the cool season world? Because we've probably got to be very careful in this heat now yes. with some of these types of materials. So in the cool season world, uh, uh, turflon or a triclopyr containing product is going to uh, carry the load there. Mm -hmm. But we, we tend to, at a minimum, apply that product in the cool part of the morning or if possible, try to pick a, a period of time, two or three days, where the temperatures are going to be a bit yeah, cooler. Some moderation. Yeah, and cool season turf, but we don't have to worry about the green up issue that we have with warm season grasses like zoysia, so we can actually target the violet during the cool period of the year, during uh, kind of late spring, when violet is actively growing, but, but the temperatures are cool enough that that ester formulation of uh, triclopyr will not be too injurious to the turf. And we, and we can in tall fescue or, um, well, even even Kentucky bluegrass in cool weather, but I would usually lower the rate on Kentucky bluegrass. But in tall fescue, 32 ounces per acre of a, uh, a triclopyr ester is a very effective wild violet uh, treatment. Although I don't know of a herbicide that can kill violet in a single application. Okay, these are going to pretty much be sequential. Yeah, I would say two to three applications at a quart per acre of uh, turf line ester, trying to get that out before the type of heat we're experiencing now occurs. And, and if, if the temperatures get hot in the middle of your treatment regime, uh, if you're above 90 degrees, dial your turf line rate back. If, if we were talking about zoysia grass, I'd go down to eight ounces. If we're talking about tall fescue, I would go down to 16 ounces. Okay. And then in the fall of the year, if uh, any of the violet persists, hopefully we're getting down to a spot treatment scenario now, you can come back and hit those plants as well. But just be aware that trichopyr, it's very effective on these hard to kill broadleaves, but if you get an excessive rate out, you can actually thin turf grass. It can be that severe. Uh, and if it's very hot, uh, you need to lower the rate because it can be injurious to turf at excessive rates or in excessive heat. So most of what you've just said would also apply to Creeping Charlie, 
right? Another yes. one of the ones I think now, about. We're, we're talking about those types of broad ground leaves, ivy. ground ivy, or it's a, it's came up. Okay. question there. Yeah. Right. So these are the types of weeds that uh, that the market leading broadleaf herbicides like Trimet Classic or Speed Zone or Escalade or, or some of these products that contain 240 dicamba MCPP. Those products will kill most of the clover, they'll kill dandelion, they'll take out most of the plantains, things like that, but they will leave behind the ones we're talking about, violet, they'll leave behind wood sorrel, they'll yep. leave behind uh, ground ivy, also called creeping charlie, uh, and there are a few others, Virginia buttonweed, for example. Some of those wild strawberry. Some of the strawberry plants are gonna be, um, uh, that's hit and miss, sometimes you can get those with a three-way, but, but yeah. So in, in those cases, We've always seen triclopyr to be more effective than our standard herbicides, but the reason triclopyr is not a standard is because of the injury risk. Uh, you do carry a, a risk of discoloring the lawn for a short period of time, and if you really go off the wagon with an extremely high rate or get out there in really hot summer weather, you, you know, I've, I've, had, I've seen situations at four to six X rates where the lawn was thin 50%, like you lose half of Grass. So Whitney's given us some pictures here in the background. So this is ground ivy and creeping Charlie, and you'll have a very distinct smell. Yes, uh, it's a mint. Yeah, yep. It's a mint family, and so this is one of the ones with square stems. It does have square stems, okay. and one thing about it that so right now we're we're seeing it in full bloom, and it does look a little different when it's blooming than uh, the rest of the year. Mm -hmm. So the bloom period, uh, at least in Blacksburg, is in early May, and it lasts about three weeks or so. And so if you're uh, elsewhere in the state, you might back that bloom period up a little bit to say early to mid April through early May. But for us, it's most of the month of May and it's going to look like that image there. The rest of the year, it's got stolons that creep along the ground and the leaves generally lay flat to the ground. Mm -hmm. So you really don't have a whole lot of uh, vegetation sticking up So it's up growing in the air more like upright when it's in flower. It grows more upright when it's in flower, yes. Okay. Will any of these herbicides we're talking about, are there any large differences in terms of concerns with volatility and how uh, they could move into any other vegetation? Or is that something where well, we talk about it, but generally it's not that big of a deal? Well, I guess one, uh, it, it, it's a matter of perspective. You could say it's not that big of a deal because we use these products on thousands, hundreds of thousands of lawns um, every year, every week probably. And we, we have very few problems. But, but yes, it is, it is a concern. All of the market-leading broadleaf herbicides that contain hormone-type herbicides like 2,4-D, dicamba, MCPP, triclopyr, clopyrrolid, those, those types of products, do inherently have the ability to volatilize, which means the, the product that's been applied to the turf can dissipate as a gas, and that product will can move. Now, normally, air, the, the convection process, which is caused by heating the ground, so you got a really hot ground, which is heating the air close to the ground, that hot air wants to rise. And so it rises constantly. So everything that lands on the ground gets caught up in an airstream that always moves up and up and up and up. And this dilution process is such that even with the volatility we experience with these herbicides, they almost would never cause a problem because they're so rapidly diluted and pulled up and away from our desirable vegetation. But there are certain circumstances. Uh, for example, we spray early in the morning to, to have cooler temperatures, which is less injury risk to the turf. But early morning application, depending on the type of weather fronts that may be coming in, in this case, we don't have that rapid heating of the ground. So we don't have this potential for convection to move the air up. And if a warm air mass happens to move in in the middle of the night, it could be warmer up above than it is mm -hmm. down low. And if that happens, then your herbicide is gonna move up about six feet and be trapped. And that air volume is just gonna move around. And, and we can see substantial, usually it's not death to our desirable ornamentals, but when the leaves are all twisted up, bloom density is cut in half, you know, people aren't real happy about that. So it takes a while to recover from that. One of the questions that has come in recently, but and I'm also living into a little bit too, we have two tomato plants in pot in the house, which are the sacred tomato plants. <laughs> yeah. And I was told, don't you do anything that could damage these. But tomatoes in particular, in my experience, very sensitive, very sensitive yeah. to any of these. And so any of you all that are gardeners, 
uh, but tomatoes, I don't know if peppers apply, but I've always been very cautious around any type of tomato plant with some of these applications. We'll finish this up, one more thing. Granulars versus sprayables. You've mostly been talking about sprays now. Granular formulations are out there, and a lot of uh, the DIYers, that's what they have easiest access right. to and find that. But how about the strategies to achieve the best control possible with, with a granular formulation? Right. That's a great question. Uh, granular formulations, by nature, are going to be less prone to rapid volatility. In other words, the loading in the air would be less. So that's one advantage. Um, they're easier to apply. As you just mentioned, they're more available to homeowners. That's another advantage. Uh, but there are, as, as you suggest, um, methods that you can employ to get maximum effect out of those because by nature, the type of, now we're talking about post-emergence broadleaf post control. Now there are many different types of herbicides used for many different purposes, but we're talking about killing broadleaf weeds after they've emerged. And there are granular products for that, but I can tell you all of the active ingredients or almost all of the active ingredients that are on the market require that herbicide, that ingredient that's in that granule to dissolve and move into the leaf. Well, that can't happen as a granule, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll find on the bag of many, like Scott's Plus 2 is probably the market leading product. The, the Plus 2 part is 2,4-D and uh, MCPP. Both of those products require foliar absorption and the, the, the bag is going to tell you somewhere, probably in pretty small print, that hey, Product uh, efficacy is going to be improved if you apply when dew is on the foliage. And so it's very important with those products to get out early in the morning when you have a really thick dew and then rotary spread the granules. And the granules, in this case, will stick to that water on the foliage. And that's why the dew is so important. Right. It's going to stick to the water and the dew is sitting there. It's going to dissolve that granule and allow, allow the 2,4-D and MCPP, in this case, for that product to move into the foliage. There are um, many granular products that will be vastly improved by applying when there's dew on the surface. And, and in fact, many of them, when, they're, when the, the leaf surface is completely dry, will have almost no activity. Very, very little activity from those because we get some but minimal root uptake. So. Okay. We got a question. Do these products harm the watershed? Well, certainly uh, any product, whether it be pesticide or even consumer household chemicals, uh, can harm watersheds if they're not used properly. If, you, if you, you're going out and doing things that are not on the label, uh, you know, in an extreme case, walking to a body of water and dumping the product in or, or using a body of water as, as the place where you dispose of your waste, I mean, that sounds silly, but I'm sure it's been done. Uh, yes, then in that case, the products could harm watershed. If they're used according to label recommendation, no, they're not going to harm any watershed. Probably the most basic strategy, at least what I see, and this especially works for the granules, but it would also be the sprayables, is you keep it in the turf at the labeled rate, following all those labeled directions that are out there, it's not going anywhere. Because yep. we're always worried. Now, if you go off label, application levels are wrong, application strategies, delivery methods are wrong. But if it's a granule bouncing on a street, a sidewalk, anywhere that goes to stormwater, now we violated the principle of protecting water quality. Because right. It's just, just as soon as in there. And the label will tell you not to do this, but the average homeowner may not know that. Uh, but yes, uh, I know your your uh, favorite slogan is often what happens in turf stays in turf if you because get yep. turf is our urban filter. I mean, it's what we literally use to filter pot potential contaminants from reaching water. Uh, in agricultural systems, it's recommended that you plant a turf filter strip around your bodies of water. So in the lawn, the same is true. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing urban filter, not only from all the petroleum products, uh, not to mention an air filter because of all of the uh, contaminants from automobiles in the air, but it is a filter of our urban water system as well. But as you said, if those granules are sprinkling onto the street and you're not going to do anything to remove them and put them back in the grass, they might as well be sprinkling into the water because the, the municipal uh, watershed system is concrete and pipe and, and things like that. There's absolutely nothing in that system that's organic that can bind to those pesticides and either break them down or bind them from lateral movement in the water. So 
If they land on the street, there's nothing to stop them from flowing straight to a water body somewhere. And so we, we definitely, and that's not that hard to do. Professionals, you'll often see, and we've heard a lot of complaints about this, you'll often see a professional with a granular spreader out there and there's stuff scattering all onto the street and on the hardscape and everyone freaks out. But what they don't see is the last thing those uh, folks do is they grab a backpack's blower like you would use to blow leaves around and they go right back along that hardscape and blow all those granules back. Now, certainly if, if the professional outfit has left the area, you still have granules on the street, that's a cause for complaint. But, but normally, it's natural in the process of spreading these things, something's going to hit a hardscape. We just need to be conscientious enough to either get a broom and a dustpan or a blower or something and blow them back into turf. Yeah, and that's where in the world of our uh, urban nutrient management is what has led to our current degree of, of interest and concern was folks just weren't giving this the proper attention and uh, get in a hurry and throw things out there. And we've had a lot of times uh, people want to see some granulars on their sidewalk on the driveways to confirm that their lawn service company had actually paid them a visit. Uh, I understand that rationale, but that's a very poor rationale when it comes to protecting the environment. I, I told somebody the other day, if you don't have enough trust that they're actually making your application, you might not have the right lawn service company that you're dealing with. Let's move on here, Dr. A. I've got here, it says, emails going around Northern Virginia warning people not to use Roundup, that's uh, glyphosate, because it causes cancer. I don't think a link between glyphosate and cancer has been established. Has Tech said anything specifically on this? So I happen to be a contributing scientist to GMOanswers.com. So GMO, which traditionally is going to stand for Genetically Modified Organisms, and it's kind of a hot topic in, in, in mainstream media and, and for others. Um, but GMOanswers.com is a consortium. It, it's, it's created, it's actually a, um, it's, a it's, it, it's not run, quote unquote, by any of the chemical companies, but it's funded by chemical companies. But the way it's run is that scientists both from the companies as well as from universities from around the world if you have expertise for example on cancer they're going to seek you out they, they pay another company to seek these people out and solicit responses to any question there's thousands if not hundreds of thousands of questions that have been submitted over the years on gmo answers i guarantee you, you'll find plenty of information about this one that's going to cite sound scientific literature uh and and I myself has debunked, have debunked some of these uh, claims about Roundup and skin cancer or other types of cancer. It's bogus. There are a few scientific papers that have been published, but the the methodology in it, the number one, the journals are extremely obscure journals in the middle of nowhere that no one's heard of, and the methodology in the papers are they don't meet scientific rigor in right, these cases. Right. And so, and then if, when, you, when you weigh that against the stack of scientific papers with much more rigorous uh, methodology that have been published to say that glyphosate does not cause cancer, um, it's, there, there's plenty of information. I don't want to get outside of my realm of expertise here, but there's plenty of information on gmoanswers.com to answer that question for you. GMOanswers.com would be a great one to check and see. And then spread the word and let people uh, continue the discussion about this. Uh, ben, Ben, hope things are well up northeast. I suspect that it's pretty warm for you. And Ben's got a question here. What's the best product to control pineapple weed in cool season turf? And Ben's got some pretty awesome uh, bluegrass up in the uh, Massachusetts area. So pineapple weed, I don't hear about that one very often. I, um, I hear about pineapple weed often enough. I ha I've never had a trial specifically for pineapple weed, but I've, I have killed pineapple weed before. Um, I think the key to pineapple weed is to try to catch it before it starts blooming, and it's not very um, conspicuous at that time. But knowing where it was last year, you're going to have a real good indication of where it's going to be next year, and trying to catch it when it's younger with market-leading products um, and I would say that if, if that's not working, my next go-to, as I mentioned before, for hard to kill weeds would be a triclopyr containing product, but I don't have enough experience with pineapple weed 
control to say specifically what products can work better. This is one of those ones. Ben manages a lot of athletic fields, but I see it around here in particular in our parking lots. So I'm right. assuming it is probably in response to compacted soils makes it more yes, competitive. I, I agree. I, I typically see pineapple weed uh, restricted to compacted areas. Uh, another thing, you see, if, if that lawn bin is uh, pure Kentucky bluegrass, metsulfuron is also an option for you. But if there's tall fescue or ryegrass in the mix, then stay away from metsulfuron. All right. Are we current on questions? So you all keep the questions coming. Compacted, recessed, athletic fields, KBG, oh, yeah, KBG and rye. Oh, and so, rye. So, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, the rye would limit that triclopyr right. application in this case. Yeah, so, and there also could be some some possibilities for pre-emerge control of pineapple weed. Again, I, I would have to, to Google this and look it up, but the products that, that I would want to check and see if there's any information out there about for pre-emerge broadleaf control in, in uh, a Kentucky blue rye system, um, we would look at uh, Tower by BASF, mm -hmm. which is dimethenamide. We would look at uh, Pennant, which is metolachlor. Uh, pendimethylin, uh, which is pendulum. Uh, granular oxidizon also has a lot of broadleaf uh, pre-emerge activity. And then if you, if, if your problems are localized and, and you've got the budget, then you can go with a, a soxabin containing product. Gallery. Again, I, I don't have, uh, you know, pineapple weed also being a weed of ornamental beds, Dr. Durr, Dr. Jeff Durr at Hampton Roads AREC may have some experience with pre-emerge control of it with some of these products because that's more often how they're going to target their weeds is their broadleaf weeds is through pre-emerge. We, we really don't use pre-emerge herbicides to target broadleaf weeds because we have such effective post-emerge broadleaf weed killers in our turf grass. But in Dr. Durr's world, in the ornamental beds, azaleas and, and petunias or whatever, uh, they tend to have to target the broadleaves pre-emerge because that's when they can kind of get that uh, selectivity. Maybe ben, I'll them. follow up and we'll seek out some other things for you about pineapple weed and I'll send them to you by email. And, and as Sean says, if Dr. Durr at our Hampton Roads AREC has any other information, we'll pass that along to you. All right, Stephen Hatcher's tired of talking about broadleaves. He wants to get to grasses, which arguably in a turf grass system is a more difficult yeah, grass weed and to grass. control. Yeah, trying to kill Wait, grass Are you gonna find grass. us some pictures over there? All right, and he's already given us a list of orchard grass, goose grass, Bermuda grass. So, sure, let's uh, let's talk about that. So, uh, I'll start with uh, Stephen's list here. We'll start with orchard grass. Currently, we do not have any selective herbicides that are registered to control orchard grass in a cool season grass system like tall fescue. The research that we've done shows that there is activity from fluazifop, which is the active ingredient in fusillade or ornamec, but I'm pretty sure that uh, neither of those labels mention orchard grass as a target pet, so that could be an issue. Um, we've also had activity on orchard grass from tenacity herbicide, which the active ingredient is mesotrion, uh, but neither of those well, with, with Ornamec, we were able to kill the orchard grass, but at, at about the point where we were taking out half of our fescue. So it's, you know, yeah. it, it gets... Grass control. Right. So for that reason, the standing recommendation for orchard grass is spot treatment with something like Roundup and, uh, or hand digging. Uh, orchard grass really does, I mean, a lot of people like will huff about this, but uh, orchard grass does lend itself to hand digging. Because it's such a tightly defined It, it is clump. a tightly bunched tight. Uh, plant and even if you don't get all of the plant it takes that plant a long time to rebuild that bunch and so if you come back and continue to work on it it's going to lend itself to hand removal much better than for example Bermuda grass or or, yeah, a creeper. Uh, or some of the ones that even with the ones that are perennials but they seed themselves aggressively so that they're integrated throughout yeah. the landscape orchard grass tends to be very clumpy now the challenge here is you actually are going to have to bring some soil in literally to yeah literally fill in you know that if, gap. if i were dealing with a, a a fairly severe orchard grass situation i would just i would try to find a local sod grower that um you know sells roll a roll at a time yeah. and um 
I would go around with a shovel and dig those clumps out, and then I would cut a piece of sod the size of that clump and pop it right in. Talk to me about, uh, I'm always uh, like you talk about the glove on glove or All glove right. in glove method. That's also a really good one. You know, I said spot treat with Roundup, and arguably that doesn't need to or have to be a pump garden sprayer. Um, and, and my students, have, I've talked about this for a long time, but I've only recently had graduate students actually go out and do an experiment employing the glove and glove method, and which I'm going to explain here in just a second. Uh, and they were blown away by how quick it was and how, how easy it was. But uh, so what you do is you, you take a, now this is on the label of a product like Roundup. This would be considered a wiping application. You put on a protective glove, like a nitrile glove. And over that, you get a, like a $1 pair of cotton, like those brown cotton gloves. Cheapest gloves? Yeah, real cheap gloves that are going to be absorbent. And so you put the cheap glove, the absorbent glove, over the top of the, um, the protective glove. You take a, a bucket and you mix up a 10% Roundup solution. So one part Roundup to, and nine parts water. And then you just get your cotton glove wet and you just reach and grab the gently grab the leaves and pull you know just streak up on um, the leaves of the plant that you're targeting like that orchard grass plant and then move on to the next plant and it's uh it's a, and it works great in ornamental beds as well where you can use your dry arm to move foliage out of the way and just go around you're not pulling the weeds you're just kind of gently touching them all to get that roundup on them there's no chance of uh, ricochet or splash of, of the spray onto your ornamental, which is often what happens on ornamental beds. There's no chance of the wind coming along and drifting that spray onto your desirable ornamentals. Uh, it is a little there's, more labor intensive, but it's nowhere near as bad as hand pulling when the weeds return. How know. about there's no chance of the goatly spot killing method, which usually must put out about a 10x rate because we're all guilty of when you go out there with a backpack and do this, you hit it and you should move, but no one is comfortable with that little light. You well, know, no one wants to move the wand back until they've said die at exactly. least three times in their mind. You right? literally so. see liquid dripping off That's the leaves. Right. That, and so I am guilty of that. I admit it. And I'm trying to learn. He's been working on me, but this does limit that. And the splash and splatter onto other things. Uh, I, I tell people about this and they think I'm making this up, the glove and glove, but I'm like, especially with plants that are this large, this beefy, this much foliage out there, that's an ideal way to target that with very little damage around it. And it's, it's very rapid. Uh, it, it, it does, you can cover a lot of area uh, very quickly. And, it, and it, when you're done, it does not leave this large one meter diameter dead spot, you know, Really, the, the death is restricted only to the targeted weed. Wait, how about taking us to goosegrass? And you can find some images there. Let's talk goosegrass next. Yeah, and for goosegrass, unlike orchard grass, we do have options to control goosegrass post-emerge. And right now is the time of year that you'd be doing that. Uh, at least in our area, the goosegrass is just starting to till it. I mean, I mean it's, it's easier to um, target goosegrass when it's in the seedling stage, but you can't even see it when it's in the seedling stage. But... Um, in cool season grasses like tall fescue, the absolute best product on the market for goosegrass control is Pilex. Uh, the active ingredient is Capramazone. Unfortunately, that product is not marketed to consumers. I think the, the smallest quantity you can buy costs about $400. Mm. But um, it is extremely effective. We can go out at one-sixth of the normal rate and still kill goosegrass. It's just very effective on that particular weed, which is a hard-to-kill weed for other herbicides. Um, and so one thing to point out about goosegrass, I guess, before we get too deep in the, in the weeds, pun intended, um, is that the market leading crabgrass products actually don't control goosegrass. Don't even touch. Them. Yeah. So it's, I, I actually, I like to get on Amazon sometimes and read the reviews of, of some of the crabgrass products that are out there and everyone's complaining to us. Oh, I, I sprayed it five times and it didn't control the crabgrass and it's not crabgrass. People are targeting either goosegrass or maybe Bermuda grass, things that, I mean, a grass looks like a grass. That's, that's all there is to it. And goosegrass uh, is not, I mean, not even touched by the market leading crabgrass product, which is quinclorat or drive herbicide. And it's an active ingredient that's a component of many consumer products now. And so goosegrass, you're, you're probably going to encounter that um, because if you're 
treating grasses post-emerge and some of them are dying and some of them are not, could be goosegrass. So Pilex, not as available to consumers. Tenacity, you can get that for about 50 to 60 bucks uh, online. But the goosegrass better be darn near microscopic. Yeah. Uh, it can kill it, but it, it's got to be really young. You can't really treat a plant that you can see from a standing position, for example. And um, with repeat application, we can take down maybe a two-tiller plant. But So one of my uh, students, undergrads, several years ago was told me when because we used to do these ID quizzes and he said the way I always know goosegrass when it comes up it looks like a wagon wheel spokes of a wheel spokes of a wheel much more compressed lays down flat and goes and we're always looking for ways to distinguish between grass but that's always stuck with me because he's right until it really starts growing up like we see here with this the seed is very characteristic too it looks like a zipper but when you see something that is laying out flat kind of whitish stem very compressed okay but think wagon wheel you've probably identified goose Summer annual, yes. will die at frost, but it's going to be going bonkers right now. Yes. And this is another one that tends to thrive, again, as we look for indications of why it's there. Compacted Compaction. soils in particular is where this one shows up. Yes, yeah, so you'll see this uh, in the center of your driveway, along walking paths where people have to veer and, and, and get off the beaten path. And anywhere that's really compacted, goosegrass is a, a serious issue. And it's, it's a serious issue because... Uh, it is resistant to most of the pre-emerge herbicides that are out there. So it, it, it's, it's one of those plants that has a lot of genetic variability. So it's been able to develop resistance more rapidly than other weeds. And it also naturally is resistant to most of the post-emerge herbicides that we use for crabgrass. So, and so Pilex came along in 2013 and it is unbelievably effective on this weed. One last product that I will mention that's also available to consumers because you can get it for uh, about $85 online at a one pint quantity is a claim extra. Uh, a claim on tall fescue can be quite effective for goosegrass because we can go up to 42 ounces per acre. Now, even at 42 ounces per acre, you're probably not going to control a big gnarly plant like the one that Whitney's just put up on screen there. But um, a couple applications though at that rate would take that plant out and and tall fescue can handle that, but our maximum rate on Kentucky bluegrass is uh, 28 ounces, and which is still a pretty effective rate of acclaim, but may require repeat applications. What we don't want to do is let the plants get to that stage. Um, hand removal, when, when you're, yeah. so Pocket goosegrass is going to be, be uh, it's going to germinate uh, throughout the summer. And so at all times, when you, when you walk up on a population, you're going to have plants that look like that, and you're going to have little seedlings as well. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with spraying a herbicide application, taking out all those seedlings slowly with a product like Acclaim while you come in and, and hand pull, or I like the, um, you can actually use these um, uh, instruments to help with the hand pulling. And I don't know the name of it, it's just a weed puller, but you've borrowed mine yeah, before. Yeah, the weed popper thing. Yeah, yeah, you just press it in the ground and it just pops the weeds out. It works great on uh, round, dandelions and goosegrass that look like that plant in the previous image or that plant right there. So ideally, if you have this and have a history of this, this is probably, you either got to treat it early or you probably want to put out a pre-emerge. Yes, change your pre, if you're on a pre-emerge program, change the active ingredient to something else. You might see better effectiveness. The, the, the ones that work well are prodiamine, pendimethalin, and dithiopyr, uh, or oxidizon, which is, Less available to homeowners, but it's out there. It's more used for ornamental beds in the consumer market. But oxidizon is a very effective pre-emerge for goosegrass, long-lasting, and can be used in cool-season grasses as a granule. Um, that would be by far the best if you can find it. But the others all work as well as long as the goosegrass is not resistant. And but they don't persist long enough to catch goosegrass. Starts germinating in hotter weather, and so. It tends to start its germination process on the tail end when most of our pre-emerge herbicide for crabgrass oh, yeah. has dissipated. Yeah. And that's by nature, that's what EPA wants these things to do. They don't register products that hang around forever. They, they, they don't allow them through the registration process. What they want are products that tend to last maybe a couple of months and then eventually they're degraded by a number of means, whether it's sunlight, uh, hydrolysis, microbial feeding, um, and so goosegrass starts to germinate on the tail end of that process when most of your herbicide has already been eaten 
uh, that's when, when goosegrass starts. And so a lot of our products miss goosegrass because of that as well. Okay. When, if you'll find Bermuda grass, let's talk about uh, Bermuda control here. And I assume we're probably going to spend most of our talk, time talking Bermuda control in cool season turf. But that was the we third one questions, on the list. I think, I think Witt's responding about okay. what type of gloves to yeah. use there. So, all right, Bermuda control. Bermuda's going bonkers now in right. mid-Atlantic. Um, After being nearly killed by the winter. Yeah, and if it didn't die in the winter, now it's making up for lost time. So it's going to be a challenge. And so, all right, so what are your thoughts? What can we do now or do we wait, et cetera? So, okay, I'll try to summarize the whole Bermuda thing uh, as quickly as possible. The, the power of a Bermuda control program is – late summer through fall applications. So as you're planning an approach to attack Bermuda, keep that in mind. That is, that is your, uh, your final thrust, okay? That's when you're gonna breach the gates and take the castle, is late summer and fall applications. But the siege, okay, that's this time of year. All right, we're, we're looking to do something that's going to starve Bermuda, that's going to slow it down, keep it from expanding from, say, 30% lawn coverage to 90% lawn coverage as the summer progresses. And so we are not, I'm going to tell you now, you are not going to kill Bermuda grass with summer applications ever. It, that can only be done in the fall. But we can, we can shut it down. And so I would opt for the cheapest method of shutting it down this time of year and that's going to be a combination of tenacity herbicide with turf lawn if we're talking about tall fescue right if we're talking about kentucky bluegrass you can up the tenacity rate actually normally i would go five ounces uh, per acre followed by five ounces followed by five ounces this is at three week intervals uh, in tall fescue and i would add to that a quart of turf lawn acid. Now, is this tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass? I'm talking tall fescue tall right fescue. now. So okay. the tall fescue program this time of year would be every three weeks, five ounce tenacity with uh, a quart of turf lawn. But recently it got over 90 degrees. If that starts to happen, even on tall fescue, I'm going to dial that turf lawn rate back. If I'm getting above 90, I'm going to dial that turf line rate back to about 16 ounces. But again, right now, we're just talking about suppression. We're just we're shutting to hold it down. It back. Yep. And the, the, the turf line is helping with uh, the control, but it's also reducing the bright white symptom that you get from a product like Tenacity. All right, so that's my fescue program. If I were doing this in Kentucky Bluegrass, I would raise the tenacity rate to eight ounces, but drop the turf lawn rate to about eight ounces, 16 at the most, especially during hot weather. So it's tenacity turf lawn, three applications at about three week intervals, leading us into about the first of August. So we should be kind of in the middle of this program right now. For the month of August, I usually lay off. That's just, it's too hot. So much stress. It's so much stress. You, you're, you're, you're probably getting moisture stress to the turf, heat stress to the turf. Why would we add the herbicide stress? And yes, it means Bermuda grass is going to gain a little bit during the month of August, but it's better to just not harm your desirable turf. But toward the end of August, we get back on the program as air temperature starts to cool, and we put three applications. In this case, it's not Tenacity Turf Line because that's not the most powerful product on, uh, combination on the market. In this case, you've got two options. The preferred option would be Pilex plus Turf Lawn. Uh, and that's going to be Pilex at one ounce. And uh, Turf Lawn Ester, again, at 32 ounces in, in temp temperatures of 75 degree or less air temperatures. Um, and then dial the Turf Lawn rate back a little bit as the temperature rises above 75. So it's Pilex Turf Lawn three times, three week intervals in the fall with the last application right before severe frost. So we're, gonna, we're talking ahead here, but this is going to be the best way to target Bermuda. This is how we kill Bermuda. Because what we're doing is we're, we're causing all this injury and we're backing it up as close as possible to, to winter stress. Okay. And so two things happen. The Bermuda is not able to prepare for winter stress and we, uh, the injury that we've caused is only going to be um, exacerbated by the winter stress that's coming. 
So how we do tend we, to get a lot more winter kill of Bermuda when we've done these herbicide programs. How do we make that judgment call on the date? Do we look at an anticipator or an average frost date would, and backtrack or what? An, an, uh, anticipated or average. If the frost uh, catches you a little early, no problem. Or if you, the more time you give, though, let's say we have a warm November or October or something like that, that's going to help the Bermuda. There's nothing you can do about it because you couldn't predict it, but it is yeah. what it is. Uh, and you don't want to go too late after frost because the Bermuda shut down, so it's not going to absorb more chemicals. So, uh, so we are looking, though, roughly, is, would it be six weeks? In the Blacksburg area, we start August 20th. In Richmond, I would start about September 5th to 10th. On the beach, I would probably be somewhere toward the end of September when I started the program. Okay. What I'm trying to, if I could tell them, say, all right, a target would be if I knew an, uh, my average frost, first frost date, killing frost date, is mid-October, would I then back up? roughly six weeks from that to initiate roughly, this or not? Yes. Ballpark gap? Because we're talking three apps and there'll be a six week gap between the first app and the last the final app. one. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Then we don't have to be extremely precise on that. It's just, but what we don't want to you do You don't want to wait is, too late. You don't want to wait too late. And really I haven't done a whole lot of work on waiting too late, but what more often happens is our professional lawn care operators are spraying too early. The client wants the Bermuda grass killed, like right now. They can see it. It's growing. And if you put this Pilex Turfline program out midsummer, second year results are going to be, at best, 50% Bermuda control. But if you put it out in the fall, we've seen 99% control in some so cases. 90%. Uh, yeah, it makes a big difference. So the, the standing – and this is kind of – it's a pretty intensive program, but the standing recommendation is – Tenacity turf lawn in the spring and early summer to kind of shut it down and give that client what they want, you know, midsummer without breaking the bank. And, and then the real killing occurs with Pilex turf lawn in the fall. And you can, you can substitute a claim extra for Pilex. And the acclaim rate on fescue is 42 ounces. On Kentucky bluegrass, it's 28 ounces per acre. The, the, the reason I didn't really mention a claim a lot and was favoring Pilex, the two are about equivalent for Bermuda grass control. A claim is four, four times the cost of Pilex. That's a lot. Yeah, you're looking at over $200 per acre just for the acclaim, acclaim component at the 42 ounce rate. Yeah, that's enough to swing me the other direction. Right, right. So it is much more, when you add up all three applications, a claim can add an extra five, $600 per acre to the field. Saw a question pop up there, um, grubs. That's not summer weeds, but let, let's take before a step back. Before we do that, let me mention one more thing about this claim thing, but an average homeowner with 5,000 square feet of infested Bermuda grass area, they can buy one pint of a claim for 90 bucks and the minimum buy-in for Pilex is 400 bucks. Get the ninety dollars worth of the claim, it may be enough to do the whole deal. You know, what I'm yeah. it is more yeah. expensive on a per acre basis, but you're not spraying acres. Some of these chemicals almost need to be HOA chemicals. In other words, you need to get with your friends and neighbors. Yeah, that, that's that's an that option. same problem yeah. because uh, it, they can be ridiculously expensive for a single. The problem, <laughs> the problem with HOA or homeowners associations is that there's just so many people out there though that are anti-pesticide, and they they don't even necessarily know why. It's just, we've yeah. been told pesticides are dangerous, so there it is. And so um, be careful how much you talk about pesticides. I have learned as a weed scientist, I'm careful how much I talk about pesticides with my neighbors. Yeah, well, I don't trust you anyway. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, grubs, you help me out here because we are not entomologists. And, uh, but let's, uh, let's cover the basics because I, I'm anticipating this is going to be a pretty strong grub year. Uh, the beetles have emerged here in Blacksburg. Japanese beetles in the last few days are going bonkers, and they are mating like crazy. And so once they start mating, that means the next thing to follow the mating is the laying of eggs. And the rule of thumb here in the mid-Atlantic is that uh, with most of our standard insecticides, okay, we would be applying these materials somewhere around 1st of July to 1st of August. And your target is to catch these uh, grubs, when they're hatching from the eggs, get them as small as possible. And for the longest time, uh, 
one of our leading insecticides has been imidacloprid, the active ingredient in Merit. Okay, we also have triclofan, which is out there. And I was, uh, a buddy from Kentucky called me a few uh, days ago and asked about grub control in his central Kentucky lawn. He was decimated last year. And I did a little, did a little quick search and I saw, I wasn't aware of this until I started looking, but a uh, long uh, active ingredient name of chlorantranilaprol, and I won't ask Whitney to type that in. <laughs> Uh, it is now on the market, chlorantranilaprol, okay? And that one is uh, probably the current Cadillac in grub control, and it's a product that is so safe it doesn't have any type of caution, warning, or any type of tag on it from the Environmental Protection Agency. I am sure that it is quite expensive, but very specific to grubs, it actually can be applied much earlier in the year and give you season-long grub control, do it quite effectively based on research here at Blacksburg and other universities to do that. But we are just about in that window. And uh, again, for the grubs, we want to catch them earlier in their life cycles when they're young. And that's why for most standard products, we talk about basically going from in this area, 1st of July to 1st of August. When you apply them, make sure that they either get uh, you know, irrigated or washed in by rainfall to move in, into the soil. And remember that the beetle control, which now they're going to be attacking your ornamentals, that's a totally separate process than going after the grubs themselves. But do take a look and watch this new chemistry in terms of just coming into the homeowner market. Chlorantranilaprol okay, is the AI. And again, it is uh, the latest, greatest thing to come along. And pay very careful attention with any of these products to what they have about pollinator protection. Uh, that is one that you want uh, to specifically, uh, on that label, to talk about how to apply these materials such that we are not affecting the bees or the other pollinators that are out there. And again, follow the label, we won't have issues, but it's when people don't follow the labels of application that we see this happen. Okay, so I looked up, uh, I looked up GrubX. It's a Scotts product. Yeah, and, and you, so this one has. Can you distinguish what that? Uh, I think you've is. got it spelled that Whitney's got up the chlorantranilaprol. It would at least. I think that's right, and if not, it's close enough. It is that you yeah, would see that. Yeah, that. So that is the active ingredient in GrubX, which was actually mentioned in the question. Yeah. So they changed these active ingredients. This is a recent, uh, we've been waiting for it to come into the homeowner market. And this was the first year, and it doesn't mean it hasn't been out there, but this is the first year that I have seen this particular material. So I think this is probably the latest chemistry that we have. I Again, I anticipate it will be more expensive. I don't know that. I didn't price it. But uh, I was pleasantly surprised to see that it is now available because up to this year, that had been exclusively a professional LCO uh, offering for that. I didn't mean to interrupt your pollinator mm -hmm. comment uh, because it is, it's very important. And there's two, well, there's a couple of ways to protect pollinators from these insecticide applications. Um, in areas where you have, where, where it's desired to have integrated forbs with your turfs, for example, white clover, or, you know, the extremely good pollinator serving plants, uh, even dandelions, things like that. Uh, if there are parts of your lawn that are managed for that purpose, great. Um, at, at a, and, it, and if you've got serious grub problems and skunks are coming in and digging everything up and you want to do something about it, uh, at a minimum, you need to mow the blooms off. They'll be back uh, within a few days, but try to mow as many blooms off as possible uh, before apply, applying the product so that the product is not on the blooms that they'll be visiting. It'll, you know, and then water that product in so that any new blooms that are produced won't be contaminated. Uh, the other method for, for lawns that are used more for their aesthetic appeal, make sure you have good, so in other words, make sure you get out and control things like clover, dandelion, other pollinators serving plants before you apply the grub product. So those are um, two effective ways to protect as many pollinators as possible. And there's, there's places in the landscape both to serve pollinators and there's places in the landscape such as uh, uh, managed ornamental turf where it's not there to serve pollinators and that's okay. You know, uh, there, there's nothing wrong with having immaculate turf uh, as border area, you know, manage the landscape the way you want it managed, serve pollinators. Uh, there's, there's many different ways to do that. 
Stevens provided us a little information here to help about that uh, chlorantronilaprole name. The uh, common trade name for the product has been a celeprin, and he's listed a price here. This is one of those get your uh, grandkids inheritance out and spend it, $1,000 <laughs> for 64 ounces. So I'm going to bet that GrubX isn't that type of It was 40 something dollars for a small bag, yeah. and I doubt that treats a bag probably large, treats I'm not sure a few thousand I I square feet. So do keep that in mind. Uh, and there's another question. This will be one that we'll probably have to hold here uh, and see if we can't get Dr. Kuhar, one of our entomology colleagues, to come over here in a, uh, a webinar in the upcoming months. But any research on pesticide treatment of lawns and firefly decline? And I am not going to even venture a guess on that one. So we'll try to arrange to have uh, one of our entomology experts come over and take care of that with us. Yeah, I, I can say that... Um uh, I do not have a, a strong data point to link pesticide use with firefly decline because my lawn and surrounding area does get treated fairly routinely for unwanted weeds at least. And um, we have billions of fireflies. Um, I mean, my four-year-old can catch fireflies in my lawn. They're everywhere. So, but uh, yeah, that that's, I think, we, we got the same, we've gotten questions this year about, hey, where's all the hummingbirds gone? It's got to be used pesticides. Hey, where's it? And not to say that there hasn't been strong links between pesticides, oftentimes used improperly, but, but still links between pesticides and a decline of this species or another. But oftentimes these types of uh, trends in um, population uh, changes are much more complex. For example, simply the, the type of winter that we had that killed half of the Bermuda grass in the state of Virginia probably killed a few fireflies too. I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of factors involved in that. Um, but I'm trying to think of, uh, you know, to give credence to this, or to, to give an answer to this question, I don't know of a good, I guess the best thing to do would be to contact an entomologist. Yep. Yeah, we need to have an entomologist. Because I don't know of a good resource to answer that question in my world. Another question here, and again, this would be, uh, this more of a PR, uh, but how to answer customer concerns about herbicides and bee decline. Um, no doubt, uh, the, the reason that we have so much interest in insecticides and bee decline was due to some uh, very uh, obvious misapplications of material several years ago to a flowering tree that resulted in a massive bee kill. And it was quite simply an application made off label uh, to uh, treat those trees. So we get into trouble immediately when we do something like that. Uh, and again, depending on how far you dig into the literature, we're pretty convinced that yeah, these insecticides could do this. And if they're misapplied, I would say, yes, that's an issue. But we come back to, as Sean has said before, with the herbicides, if we follow the label guidelines and do everything he was talking about in terms of uh, mowing properly, say if you have clover, to remove those blooms before this application is made. So there's got to be something here where the homeowner, the client, is going to take their role in this, and it'd be up to you to tell them, listen, you've got to do this, and then you've got to train your employees that if we show up and we're going to apply a grubicide in which there is concern about potential impact on bees or other pollinators that, you know what, we wouldn't spray today. And that's not what anybody wants to hear when it comes down to the customer or your time to do this. But if that is an issue, I think that's the only way that you can address it. That's going to be where one of these, this um, a celeprin product, the Chlorantronilopro, is going to probably give us a little more flexibility in, in targeting grubs for doing this. But this pollinator thing is certainly something we can't overlook. We've got to uh, step up to the plate and do things the right way. And we've got to convince everyone, not just the professionals, because most professionals are going to do this right, but a lot of homeowners, again, we just take these things for granted. I've done this for years. Uh, it's, uh, it's a public relations campaign, and it's going to involve a lot of education. So great questions. I think these will be things. There's that, a lot of work out of your alma mater that has yeah, really it, looked at the effect. Uh, so the question was on herbicides. And, you know, the, the herbicides that are marketed right now in the turf ornamental industry have little to no impact, direct impact on honeybees. There's, there's been work out of University of Kentucky that, is, that has showed that, like how much herbicide would be residual on the blooms and what effect that has on the bees. And it's, you know, this is more of a, 
I mean, they, they struggle to show extremely strong direct effect from the insecticides, which they have shown, especially when they're applied off label. Mm -hmm. In other words, when they're applied straight to the blooms, things like that, that's where they see the effect. Uh, a lot of the factors involved in honeybee decline, again, it, it's kind of like, you know, did the winter kill the fireflies or was it pesticides? It's extremely complex. You know, there's invasive mites that are killing the bees. Uh, the way that uh, bee farmers are moving the bees around more than they used to for economic reasons is causing too much stress on the bees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But when it comes to herbicides, trying to convince a, a homeowner or a client that herbicides aren't harming the bees, I guess suffice to say, the herbicides don't directly harm the bees. The herbicides remove blooms that the bees need for food, for pollen and for nectar. And so the way that the landscape is managed is gonna determine whether there's enough food out there for the bees or not. I would argue that our ornamental planting choices in our urban landscapes have evolved to an extent that they no longer, well, they serve, I shouldn't say no longer, but they don't serve pollinators like native plants did. And we are the invasive species that is displacing all of the native ecosystem. Yeah. It's not the herbicides that are killing the bees, it's us. And if we manage our landscape in such a way as to provide plants that not just create blooms, but that create blooms that serve the pollinators that are in the area, then, then you can still have grass, you know, and you can still spray herbicides. It's not going to kill the bees because you're out there spraying herbicides. But the only effect the herbicides are having on the bees is that it's taking away wild or invasive plants that happen to coexist in that lawn with the grass. So that can be, that can be managed by then, okay, well, in my ornamental beds, I'm not going to put this stuff that does not serve pollinators or as much of it. I'm going to try to focus on a blend of plants that serve pollinators and plants that don't. Yeah, that and this sense. is some uh, work that Dr. Askew's got kicked off uh, here, and we'll hopefully have some things to talk to you about in the future about pollinators. And yeah, you, we've you, got some work. You said coexist. That's what we've got to right. do. Yeah, that's what we're doing. We're, we're doing some research right now to look at ways to incorporate early uh, blooming bulbs into kind of a, uh, a flower meadow that's managed as turf in the latter part of the season, but it serves those early season pollinators in the early part of the season. We're also looking at uh, leveraging our uh, experience in weed control. We're looking at ways to better establish pollinator gardens so that we get the desirable plants we want and the whole thing's not taken over by weedy plants that may not serve the pollinators um, like the intended uh, garden. Two questions. We got to wind this thing up. We're at 1059. I've seen past problems. How about if you give a quick comment sure. on past problem control? And the other thing is we can't get away from this with summer weed control and not say something about sedges. So let's finish up with okay. those two things. Well, past problem control and cool season turf, you're going to be looking at Ornamec, uh, Fusillade, which are both the same active, or Pilex. And this is thin past problem that's shown on the image here. Our key species in the state uh, that, that infest our turf grass is going to be Dallas grass and thin pass pile. Pass pile uh, dilatatum for Dallas grass and cetacean for thin pass pile. And both of those are going to be controlled in cool season turf with Pilex or one of the Fluazepop products, Fusillade or Ornamec. You can see information on the label of those uh, in order to do that. Uh, in warm season turf, it's a little more difficult. I would say that uh, Bayer has a product called Tribute Total. And for this, it's costly, but from a safety to weed control balance, it's the best product on the market. Uh, it takes three applications, but it's like $180 per application. Very expensive product. We just don't have good options that, that we have cheaper options, but they damage the desirable warm season turf severely. Um, and for the purposes of sedge control and cool season turf, you know, the, the market right now is dominated by sulfentrazone, which is dismissed turf. And we have a lot of um, post-patent uh, versions of that that are they're flowing onto the market right now, uh, different sulfentrazone-containing uh, compounds. And we also have halosulfuron, and that's sedge hammer. Both of those are available to consumers in low quantities. Both of them Both have pretty broad labels, effective. cool season, warm season. Three. Broad labels, cool and warm season. The halosulfuron is going to be a little bit safer than the... Uh, 
uh, the sledgehammer will be a little safer across the spectrum than dismiss. They're both safe to all types of turf. Dismiss, though, uh, you want to avoid surfactants and avoid hot weather uh, because you can start to get into a little bit of discoloration with dismiss. But the, the benefit of dismiss turf or any of the other suspension zone products that are out there is very rapid activity. Two to three days, your, your sedge is starting to get crispy, whereas with halosulfuron, it's two to three weeks. And so there's a big difference uh, between the products there. Thank you all very much for taking the time to join us again.